Good morning. I think we will we will get started. You know, thank you for uh, turning out on this very cheerful Tuesday Tuesday morning. And uh, of course, there are refreshments if you'd like to get some during the uh, uh, the meeting this morning. And of course, uh, uh, whenever we have folks come in and start to sit down, you know, this the seating and the seating choices. Are, I think somewhat reminiscent of uh, ecclesiastical arrangements on <laughs> uh, Sunday, so plenty of seats up front. Uh, anyway, welcome to our annual town hall meeting uh, to review the current state of play and what is emerging as the likely shape of the fiscal 2020 campus operating budget. Uh, this is the state biennial budget setting session for the legislature. And of course, the legislature is not quite finished yet, so there are still variables that will have to be confirmed. Uh, but the university has provided some helpful planning indicators uh, that Michelle will outline. <clears throat> and many thanks to the members of the budget committee, including the faculty or organization representative, representatives, for helping us to get this far. Uh, but there's likely still some work uh, to be done before we wrap up the budget. Now, we're hoping for a boost in state-appropriated money this year and over the biennium, uh, especially in response to the 6% improvement in our graduation rates, which is what the performance funding formula rewards. Uh, if the legislature invests more money in higher education, the better we will do by that formula. But the campus operating budget is built on our ability to recruit, enroll, and retain our students. So the reallocations so far identified are all part of the financial plan for fiscal 20 and, and beyond. Uh, an increase in state appropriation will not close the resulting revenue gap if we do not retain and enroll enough of our students in fall semester 2019. Remember, the uh, uh, state appropriations cover perhaps, uh, I think, less than a third of the expense and cost of what of educating our students. Uh, the students bear something like two thirds of, uh, of that expense. So a lot of work you know, with our students remains uh, to be sure that our financial plan holds up and enables us to finally uh, approach enrollment stabilization. The focus remains uh, on retention. And with that introduction, let me uh, ask our Chief Financial Officer and Vice Chancellor, uh, Michelle Dickerson, to come forward and start the program. Michelle? Thank you, Chancellor. So the beginning of the presentation uh, will show you where we expect to be at the end of this current fiscal year, and then some trends that we've been seeing um, in the past five years. So for the current fiscal year, um, fiscal year 19 that we're in right now, we are actually expecting to be higher in student revenue, um, tuition revenue than we projected in the budget. And so that's, uh, that's really a positive um, thing that we're looking to receive 153,000 above what the budget shows. And in total revenue, we're expecting to be around 96,000 above what the uh, budget, uh, what we placed in the budget. And the increase is primarily due to um, doing well uh, in our online course connect programs and so in receiving those funds there. So it helps us to boost up revenue and to come in higher than what was expected. For compensation, we always have a savings in compensation. That savings is just because um, we can't hire people as soon as people leave. There's always a gap in time for hiring. There's always going, going to be that. We have search committees in place. So because of that, we have salary savings. So each year we have salary savings um, in that line item. And you can see for this current fiscal year, we're looking at a $1.2 million savings um, for the year. That's only a cash savings. So with cash, we plan to spend cash um, for other areas like strategic initiatives, equipment purchases, and you'll see that on a few other slides. So it's always planned to have cash 
in the year because we know we're not going to spend total budget dollars and we do plan to use our cash also. So the 1.3 that we're planning to uh, use from cash reserves will be in the areas of uh, technology upgrades. So we have upgrades that we have to support every year um, for technology in the uh, computer network. We're also, we will also use it for equipment purchases. So that's new equipment and replacement of equipment, uh, strategic initiatives, um, financial aid, program development, um, campus equipment, other campus equipment that we may need, and then professional development training. Some of you may be aware of the professional development series that was started by HR. Um, and so with that training, there's costs that's involved. And those are some of the areas that we're committed to support that is subject to change. And like the Chancellor mentioned, um, we're not at the end of the fiscal year yet, so certain things are subject to change. We have a few more months to go. We don't expect a lot of high swings in the last two months of the fiscal year, but there could be some changes. So the trends, so what you're seeing now on the screen um, are the trends for headcount and credit hours for the past, um, what, 2013 to uh, uh, 2021, so six, seven years. So as you can see, uh, from 2013 to 2019, actually, we've had decline. We've had decline in headcount, we've had decline in credit hours. And so we've been on the scale of declining every year. Um, we are looking for stability um, starting in fiscal year 20, and we're looking forward to that, and we're looking also, or we're projecting that we may actually have uh, increase in revenue in fiscal year 21. Um, you may ask, well, what are those increases? What will support those increases? Probably our um, increases in graduate programs, um, because we've added a few graduate programs, and so that has been giving us a boost. Um, and we saw a slight increase also in undergrad when we first implemented banded tuition, but that was the first implementation of banded tuition. So we are moving uh, towards stability because our decline is not as large as it used to be, but we're definitely looking forward to getting to stability. This graph just shows uh, us going from headcount in 2013 up above 5,000 students and, and down in 2019 to below, below 4,000 students. And for credit hours, uh, we were at 57,000 in 2013, and then in 2019, as you can see, we are below uh, 45,000. So with that decline that we've experienced over the years in headcount and credit hours, of course, that has, um, we've had to look at budgeting differently because of that. We've had to look at some where we had excess budget capacity, where we can move things around, where we can make the uh, budget work for the campus within the revenue that we were receiving since our revenue has greatly declined. Um, and so, as you, as you can see, that has been a challenging um, task over the last few years, but we've managed to, to uh, work within those numbers um, and also to um, reduce FTEs back in 2016 in order to work within those numbers. So once we approach stability and growth, then we'll be able to add back new programs and um, continue to sustain and move forward. So some of the retention initiatives that we have in place in order to address the decline in hip count um, are an increase in the number of advisors, um, enhanced uh, communication and outreach to the students, increase in financial assistance, uh, the reimagining the first year programs and the summer bridge programs. And those are just some of the initiatives in place. There are others that are in place also. Um, we lose students, we tend to lose students um, in the sophomore and junior year, so retention is our biggest, our biggest problem. So our numbers are up in beginners and up in transfers, and Dorothy <coughs> will talk about that later, but where we lose students are our sophomores and juniors. So we definitely have to focus on that area. 
And that's why we have the Retention Summit in place now. And uh, the Retention Summit consists of representatives across the campus that come together and analyze why students are leaving, where are they going, um, how can we put um, uh, plans in place in order to assist students more and keep students here and help students to move towards graduation. So the budget pro projection parameters for fiscal year 1920, uh, what are we expecting uh, for that time period? So for the next fiscal year, we are looking um, to receive increases in graduate revenue, so moving towards stability or a slight increase. We're also <coughs> expecting um, an increase in graduate revenue, online course connect revenue, and this is the biennial year that the chancellor had mentioned. So we are waiting to see what the rate increases will be um, from um, the Board of Trustees for tuition, tuition rates, and then we're also waiting on the state appropriation rate increase. We should know both of those within the next um, week. We may actually know by the end of this week, and if not, at the beginning of next week. So once we, those uh, rate increases are finalized, we'll be in a better position to say how we're going to move forward with the budget for next year. So with revenue increases, we also have expense increases. So every year we have expense increases for a few things. This year, um, it will be for the medical, medical benefit rate. It went down last year, but actually uh, now it's up. So that uh, imposes additional expenses on the campus. We have an increase for university administration taxes uh, that typically increases every year. We are targeting um, salary increases. Um, we are looking at 1% salary increases for now. Once we have um, the final numbers in for state appropriations and tuition rates, we'll, you know, in a, we'll be in a better position to really uh, define what that increase looks like, but for right now, we're targeting 1%. We also have faculty promotions to support that's approved by the Board of Trustees, and then we, we also have police department uh, promotions to support. So we have expense increases every year. Uh, we have revenue increases when we have increases to the rates for tuition and the state appropriations, but we also need to have our headcount and credit hours to increase to stabilize revenue, because if we don't, then it just offsets those tuition rate increases that we receive, and we still have the expenses that we have to support. So that's what makes things a little more challenging. So the base budget for uh, fiscal year 20 is what you're looking at now. Um, and for when we budget, we always budget to balance. So the university budget office won't accept anything else except for a balanced budget. So you budget revenues to be the same as expenses. So if our revenues, if we're expecting lower revenues when we project credit hours, then we have to lower our expenses because we have to stay within the budget. We can't say, oh, we're gonna have more expenses, but we're not sure how we're gonna support them. Or we can't pass it on to the university um, budget office. That's not going to work. So um, for fiscal year 1819, the base budget, was 51,237,799. We are budgeting um, for fiscal year 20, 51,808,422. So you, as you see, we are projecting an increase um, for the budget for fiscal year 20. Uh, that increase is shown in um, student um, tuition revenue and then also in state appropriation. So we have to build in percentages at this time um, so that we can present to you at the town hall meeting. We've had discussions about that in BC for finance meetings and leadership team meetings. And so we model in a percentage, even though we're not quite sure at this time if it's going to be the percentage that we're going to move forward with. But we model in the budget projection something that's reasonable for this time. So we're projecting a 1.1% increase in revenue and, of course, in also in expenses. So each year we have um, budget hearings, and so we meet with the department. Um, the leadership team and the budget committee meets with each department on um, what their budget requests are for the next year. 
Um, because we've been seeing that decline in revenue and decline in headcount, we, uh, we were not entertaining any requests for new positions because as you see, we, we can't identify yet or be confident yet that we can support those type of increases in expenses. So what we ask people to do is just um, to um, come to the table with requests that we can support through cash reserves or through auxiliaries. So that's what this list consists of. It consists of a list of areas that the different departments targeted that um, can be supported through cash reserves, but not through budget funds. And um, just to remind you that for new positions, those have to be supported through budget funds. You can never support those through cash because it's permanent. All right, so the summary for um, our expectations and projections for fiscal year 20 is um, possibly lower headcount but credit hour decline to, to end. So we're looking for stability. So we're looking for that piece that we've seen in the past to end, and we're looking for potential revenue growth. Are there any questions? We will have questions at the end. So at this point, I'm going to move on and let Krista present on Online Course Connect. Good morning. Good morning. Um, some of you I know, some of you I'm sure I've corresponded with an email, but I'm Krista Grant. I'm the Assistant Director of Accounting, um, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit of overview of the Online Course Connect and some of the revenue that's associated with it. So for those of you who aren't aware of what that is, um, the IU Online Class Connect, I've heard it both ways, but online they call it Class Connect. It's a process that allows a student enrolled at one IU campus to register for an online class offered at another IU campus without having to go through the inter-campus transfer process. Um, it provides a mechanism for sharing faculty resources and unique classes among the participating campuses. It supports the offering of classes required for collaborative academic programs among participating campuses and increases the availability of online classes to students, which basically helps them achieve their educational goals. Um, so like a class that may not be offered here, they can take at another campus. Most of the campuses that are involved are the five regional campuses, um, although there are some with Bloomington and IUPUI. And I did find a nice website. Um, if you're interested, I can email it to you that answers a whole bunch of questions, like what kind of classes, um, do, what do I have to do to get my class to qualify? Not all online classes are considered online class connect. So that's a very good website. So a couple definitions, first of all. The two things we need to understand is the campus of instruction and the campus of enrollment. The campus of instruction gets 70% of the tuition revenue, and that's the campus that is basically offering the class. So if the class is offered here at Northwest, we get to keep 70% of the tuition. If the campus is offered at uh, East, they get set to keep 70% of the tuition. The campus of enrollment is the campus that the student is enrolled at. So our Northwest students, if they take a class at Kokomo, Kokomo gets 70% of the revenue and we get 30% of the revenue. If the Northwest student takes the class online with a Northwest, professor, we get to keep 100% because we get the 70% and the 30%. Now, on another level, when we get to my chart in a minute, so if we have a Northwest student who's taking a class at um, East or Southeast, we have to give them the 70% of the tuition, okay? So looking at fall, fall 2016, 17, and 18. So I don't know if that purple or pink. So you can see that the revenue we received as being the campus of instruction has gone from 202,000 to 220 to 331,000. Now I separated fall from spring because each uh, semester is a little bit different. So for uh, 2016, 62% of the revenue was us uh, being the campus of instruction. In 2018, 70% of the online course connect revenue was for us being the campus of instruction. The row in blue explains how much revenue we received for the campus of enrollment for the last three years. 
So now we have our total revenue, tuition revenue, for either offering the course or having a student, one of our students take the course. The fees received for OCC away hours. Whenever a student takes an online course, there's a $50 um, fee for, on, for each credit. So if they take a three credit class, they pay $150. We get to keep $20 of that. So that 27,000 is the fee that we get to keep for all the credits that students enroll in. So if you look at the gray line, the total revenue we received that we brought in for the last three years has increased. You can see it's gone from 321,016 to 473,000 in uh, last fall of 2018. Now to look at the big picture, we have to take out the tuition we have to pay to the other campuses, and that's the orange. So the OCC tuition sent to other campuses, but we want a true picture of what our actual revenue is, not just what we're taking in, but what we have to give the other campuses. So you can see the lot of the bottom row in green is our net revenue that we've received for these online courses that we offer. And it's jumped up more than 50% um, from two years ago. So that's a very positive thing. Now that's a lot of numbers. I know a lot of you maybe aren't into spreadsheets, so a nice, quick uh, picture graph <laughs> shows you um, how our fall revenue has, has increased. Now this program, I believe, started in 2014, so it's not been around that long, and our revenue's gone up quite a bit already. Now looking at spring, again, for the last three years, you can see that our uh, revenue that we've received for being a campus of instruction has gone from 204000 to 409000 so it's doubled in just two uh, years. Um, campus of enrollment, again, it's gone from 77,000 to 94,000. And then our uh, online fees have jumped up a little bit. So our total revenue that we brought in has gone from 304,000 to 530,000, again, in two years. That's a pretty significant increase. Yes? Well, if I could just quickly thank the deans for working with, and the instructional units for working with Peter. What, one of the things that has led to this is Peter goes in and actually does an analysis of all students who are enrolled in online courses and will alert the deans as to these are the students that are taking them at another campus and is there a way that we can get them to an order. So there is some strategy in terms of why we have been able to do this. So I really want to thank the entire campus for working with Peter on that to make sure that we get our online students taking classes your online courses here at Northwest. Yeah, thank you, Alexis. And I am going to show a graph in a minute comparing us to, I mean, these are great numbers, but how do we stack up against the other regional campuses? So thank you for adding that. Um, and again, if you look at the green line, our total net revenue has gone from 124 to 309. So again, in two years, it's a pretty significant increase, especially when you look at the fact that tuition or enrollment has gone down a little bit every year. Again, a nice picture for those of you who like to see it that way. Um, it looks really nice because it's gone quite a bit. And again, like I just said, so that's great for us, but how do we compare to the other campuses? So the guys in blue, that's East. They're, they've got a great program. They, um, they're really out, out above everyone else. But we are in red, so you can see how we have a really increase uh, within the last two years. Um, I do want to point out the yellow, the South Bend. So if you have more of your students taking classes somewhere else than you do having them take them online at your own campus, that explains why they're negative. So they have their self and students more and more taking classes maybe at Northwest or Kokomo or Southeast than they are taking them through um, South Bend. So that would explain why that's negative. But um, you know we're, we're catching up to East. We're having a you know, great increase there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment that East is primarily um, online classes, so they, yeah, that's, that's why they're so far above everybody else, because that's primarily what they have. But I also like to add that I rejected their courses because they'll only give a, like a one-page ad for what their course is about and not give a syllabus. So in the transfer, we, we can't work with that. I think they reach you faster. Any other questions on our online campus? Yes. I think it's a great opportunity for um, like us to encourage advisors to put students in our online classes 
and we need to be Kokomo because they are like <laughs> the golden child. So I think we have great potential to bump these numbers up on our campus just by you know community devices communicating to the students, hey, you know we're here, we're approachable. I mean, this faculty is on our campus. If you needed something, you can just walk over to their office. Mm -hmm. Going to you know trying to get a hold of a professor at the and especially, I mean, it's not a big deal, but the time zone, we're the only ones who are in central time. Yeah. So, you know, um, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um, but I've heard a lot of students say that they would take more classes if they could take them online because people are working, they don't want to necessarily have to come here, you know, after working all day. So, um, but even when we talked to the University of Bursar in Bloomington, they've really been, um, you know, pretty surprised at how much revenue that we have for the online courses. So we are being Oh, yeah. yeah, we are. Just Coco is the orange. Yeah. Orange. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Anyone would like to ask? Okay, thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Thank you. 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 Good morning, everyone. Um, I've met quite a few of you, but not sure if I've met everyone. Um, I'm Terry Chance. I am the Director of Accounting Services, and it's very nice to be able to be here and um, share this information with you. Um, I'm going to talk about the Midwest Student Exchange Program today, and the reason I'm going to talk about it is there seems to be some knowledge about it and not so much, so we thought it might be a good idea to share what we have. First of all, the Student Exchange Program is a multi-state tuition reciprocity program. Students pay 150% of the in-state resident tuition rate for specific programs. Enrollment decisions are made at the discretion of IU Northwest. The campus may exercise its right to limit participation or set specific admission requirements. Now for our campus, if it was an undergrad student coming in from one of these eligible states, the undergrad rate per credit hour would be $336.35. A graduate rate per credit hour would be $440.78. If it was the bundled undergrad rate, they would be paying $5,045. So this is a very great benefit to these students. Now you're wondering, who's eligible? These are the states who are eligible to participate in this program. Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So it is a great opportunity for recruiting for our university to get more exceptional students into our campus. These are the figures of the funding that our institution has spent toward this program the last the last two fiscal years and the current fiscal year. In 2017, we've actually spent $406,500 toward MSEP awards. In 2018, it was about $607,000, and this year, we're at about $564,000 as of right now. And I don't really see that changing at this point. The number of students we've served Fiscal year 17, 144. Fiscal year 18, 197. And this year, 161. Now those are great numbers, but I know we can do better. And as I said, this is a great tool to bring more students to this campus. So what can MSAT mean for the future of Ivy Northwest? Recruiting, recruiting future students. Retaining our current students and continuing the success of a great institution. This is a very high level because there are a lot of details involved, but I just wanted to give an overview of this program. Are there any questions? Yes. Where are the majority of the students, what state are they coming from? I assume it's Illinois, but? That would be, it is Illinois. It is Illinois. And then I assume Michigan would be second, or? I don't know who's second, but I know Illinois is the majority. We can look into that and let you know. We did extend the program to the graduate level. Uh, we started with just offering an undergrad, and I believe that was in 2016. And so this year, we extended it to the graduate level also. Mm -hmm. yes. Does this also include online students from other states? No. 
No. No, no. And actually, they pay a little less. All my students pay a little less than MSEP. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so I feel short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now I will introduce Dorothy. Good afternoon, everyone. So fall projections. I'm actually going to take a moment to kind of explain fall projections and where we are right now. So what we know is that as we're approaching 2019, 2020 to 2025, that there's an expected enrollment decline, right? And so that decline is going to happen in, certain ethnic, in a certain ethnic group. And so what will happen is what we will see is that decline and then more students are going to be of uh, African American Hispanic descent, right? So our office is maximizing every opportunity that we have um, to recruit new students. That includes everything that was talked about today, online programs, MSEP, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that's working for our office and what we're, who we're focusing on. So these numbers don't look that way. Well, you can see them better when you're sitting here. So for um, beginners and transfer students, and these are just, I'm talking about our opportunities for new incoming students this year. Our office is super excited, super excited about the opportunities that we have. So for example, this year we're up 15% in just basic applications. And so what our team did this year, uh, even more than last year, is that we took out paper applications, we took applications everywhere we went. We like to do online applications, you know, it helps with the manual entering, but um, we took them out to our to our to our campuses, um, to our students this year, and so that was helpful. And then we had a lot of on uh, on site registrations for application days at the local high schools. And then, as you can see, if you move down to beginners and transfers for admit, we're up 10 percent. So we have 10 percent at this time more opportunity than last year. And so what we're doing is we're working now in our office at Dad, you know, this is the time where you work on yield um, and you work on the next, we're working on 2020 and 19. But right now we're working on yield really hard. And so let me tell you a little bit about those activities that we're doing for first time freshmen. So for first time freshmen, we've had inside looks. I think a lot of you have heard those, uh, their pathways to career programs. We've had great success with students coming out for that. And then um, we've been working with digital messaging uh, to our students. So we're sending text messages and emails uh, to students, encouraging them to enroll and letting them know what that next step is. So academic advisors, you really should have been seeing some activities in your areas because we sent out emails uh, with your name and email, see them, uh, telling them what, they, what the next steps were and who to contact next. And so we've done that work. And then also we are looking at, for our MSEP to talk about that, uh, social media, or oh, digital advertising, can I say that more? Digital advertising, and so when uh, a student is in a certain area and they pop open their phone, messages will come up about the MSC program. So we're working on that with one of our outside vendors. And then we're also working with our transfers really heavy because the next population to be recruited are transfer students and adult students. And so we're really focusing on that. We've streamlined our communication to online to adult students to talk to them where they are, to talk to them about their fears, their time management, and so the messages are very personalized uh, to that audience group. And then with our transfer students, we're talking to them about transferring credits back to us, uh, transferring how smooth it is, and how that process works, and then they also have some concerns about going back to school. And so we're develop we've developed those messages to those students as well. We've had Transfer Cafe, like today. Um, our transfer team is over at the Arts and Sciences Center. Um, expecting a good 20, 25 students on the, on the Ivy Tech side to come over, and we're super excited about that. Um, one of the transfer, we've had two transfer events in Illinois, helping out with the MSCP, and those uh, cafes have been very successful to the point where those two colleges actually brought staff, their students to our campus. And we know that one of the reasons why a student would actually attend your institution is because they visited, you treated them well, they had a great time, the experience was great. And so that's what we, we've really worked on with our, our transfer students and our first time students. And then we also had Saturday programs. So our counselors, our transfer students, our transfer counselors opened up the doors on Saturday. I didn't ask, they asked me to have a couple of Saturdays that were students to come in and do tours. And I think each one, uh, this last one, we had like 10 students come out and just want to do just the tour of the campus. And they can bring their families, and they've done that as well. So that was really good. 
And so again, we're doing some digital advertising to the, um, to the transfer students. So if they're at South Suburban uh, Curry State right now, again, they will see these little messages come up about um, IU Northwest. And so we're excited about that. Talk to, for our adult learners, we sent out um, a direct mail campaign to those adult learners, encouraging them to apply. And that piece went out earlier this earlier this uh, this is early this is April yeah early this year and so we're targeting them with specific messages and, and mails um, so we have a lot a lot of opportunity here and talking about online students so we talked about online classes and students taking the program here taking the class here but actually what we've done is we're talking to the student about the whole degree because adult learners sometimes can't get back to campus. Right, so but the online program may work for them, and so we're talk. We've changed up our communication, even to our online students, on, on what it takes to be admitted, and then also making sure that they understand that we're not sending them honestly to new student orientation. Uh, we, when they, they can't come, they're they're online, and so we're we're changing that and working out programs for them. So, and then also we talk about the um, MSCP and the way that that is really. Um, I think we're even doing better this year. One of our recruiters actually lives in Illinois, uh, attended colleges in Illinois, and so he's helpful in giving us those insights into the Illinois market. He's passionate about it, and, uh, and that's another opportunity that we're really, really, I'm really excited about that we have him on our team uh, in that way for that Illinois market. Okay. Let me talk about these uh, enrollment numbers. Now, the projected enrollment numbers. Um, the projected enrollment numbers, that, that mix comes from, for new students, comes from um, John Helps, the Dallas State Helps, and pulling up together numbers that we're anticipating to receive. So in the spring, let me say this, so in the spring, we had 3,556 students here. That includes just degree seeking, uh, non-degree seeking, and graduate schools. And so for us, for us, all of us, in the fall, projected new students, we are to aim for 927. 927, if you think that that's a big number, it's not a big number. It's not a big number. So 927 students, um, but our, our goal in our office is to 944. So that's the push, that's the goal that we look at every day, the 944. So the newly admitted students for fall, um, 2019, this is the anticipated number of applications. Let me tell you, so we've had 229 applications, and this is why we believe that we could hit 944 in our office because of all of the pieces that you know I explained to you today, and then an energetic, a very energetic team working to get the message out and get students to this campus. And so I think we've got some great opportunity to get, we're at that point of looking at the, um, the leveling off of tuition or decrease. We're excited about it. And so we're excited that you're partnering with us. I've walked around and talked to a few of you about partnering with us and making sure we're all on one accord in what we're doing. And we want to say from the Office of Admissions that there's something that we can do to help you reach your students, work with them. We want to do that with, with that work with you specifically, okay? And that's it on my part, Michelle. And Dorothy, how do we identify transfer students? Because they fill out a card um, during the point of interest to tell us that they, they are, that they have previous college credit. Mm -hmm. Yes? Dorothy, can you explain the 927 again? What is this number? This number is first time freshmen and transfer students new to the university. Okay. Yes? Dorothy, what's the number one thing we can do? Help as we walk on our campus with our students. Like, what, what, what helps? What, how, do, how can we collectively help? So, if the, so when you're when you walk around campus and you're talking, I would say the first thing is, and I've said this before, is just to make people feel welcome. Like, you never know if the student is new or continuing student. So, just making them feel uh, welcome to the university is great. But if you ever see a tour ever see a tour going on, definitely stop and talk to them. Say, I mean, you're fine to do that. Welcome them, see how their tour is going, how things are going. I think that would be the number one thing that you could do for us right now. And then second, I would say that if you see opportunity, let us know. Yes, anyone else? 
Yes. On um, on IUDA, I know that you waived the application fee. Yes. Was that helpful? Was it successful? Do you, or maybe you don't know the number. Well, we know that the I know the number. I, I looked this up the other day. We had eight actual eight students actually apply from that day. That was helpful. Every one is helpful, right? So. Um, what was also helpful about that is that we had something to grab onto uh, your coattails and it helped build momentum and excitement about the university. And so that's the other thing with other, when campuses, when you're having programming or activities going on, let us know. You, you probably say you should know, but sometimes you know, it gets weighed down in all the messages. But if you really point that out to us, we want to you know, grab onto that and promote it. And so if you see something on our Facebook page, share it, post it back out to the community. That's what we're asking you to do. I know a lot of departments have those kinds of programs, and that would be helpful as we collaborate together. Yes, it was an awesome day. We had students come in um, from high school to come in to, to, to uh, for IU Bay and show off their IU uh, pride and we took pictures and all that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen and Terry. I wanted Dorothy to end because I wanted to end on a positive note. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want us to just focus on the decline, but on things that we're doing to progress and to grow revenue. So are there any other questions before we leave here today on the whole budget process or any of the numbers you've seen? There was a line item for advising mentors. What, what does that mean? What? That is basically in the uh, School of Business, and I believe they are adding students to be mentors to other students. And so that is what those funds are for. University. Uh, UA taxes. Yeah, yeah. Is that like taxes that our institution pays to Bloomington? Yes, that's, uh, we pay for the services that they provide to us um, and all the departments there that support the regional campuses. So that would be like UIT and the legal department, insurance, uh, the university budgeting office um, that pulls the budget together for the whole campus. Um, so their purchasing department is there, who we'll oversee uh, vendor selections and who we use a vendor for vendors. So all those main big departments, internal auditing, they are in, either in Bloomington or in um, Indianapolis. And so we do have to pay administrative taxes for that support. And if we didn't have them to support us, then our budget would be would have to be a lot larger than what it is because we would have to have all those departments ourselves here on this campus and we don't. Thank you. Other questions? Is the tuition going to continue for the next academic year or do we not yet know? It will continue. There has been no discussions that I'm aware of that it will not, so I'm pretty sure it will. Thank you. Anything else? Any questions for um, John on the positive projection on headcount moving forward? That's my cue to have John weigh in. <laughs> um, I, I'll just say that um, you know there there are some projections out there that are kind of more nationally um, uh, looked at. There's West Western States Commission on Higher Education does some. Um, the Department of Education, and I know that the Midwest has been, uh, you know, looking at 18 to 20 year olds declining over the next several years. Indiana usually is a little bit better uh, off than, say, Ohio and Illinois and that, but but we're looking at the clients as well. But when you look down, you drill down into the counties that we serve, um, there's a leveling off. Of, of those declines over the next couple of years. So we're going to see probably um, a little bit of a, uh, a leveling off of the high school graduates uh, compared to what we've seen in the last several years. And hopefully that will help us. Um, but the, uh, um, the caveat to that is that because of the other states having declines, it's going to be competitive out there for these students. So. 
the things that Dorothy's saying about recruitment and retention and everything that's take those to heart. Thanks, John. All right. I believe that ends the meeting for today. Thank you for coming again.